Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Lecture 26, before we get to announcements, when I start seeing it's the fall and I start seeing dates like the 26th, uh, my mind goes to a Thanksgiving break, which is about a month away. Yep? I'd like to be clear about something. The Wednesday before Thanksgiving is, by a campus rule, a non-instructional day. Therefore, there will be no lecture and no labs. All those of you who have bought plane tickets should know what is going on there. The homework that is due that week will make it reasonable so that it's not due right while you're eating your th turkey. We'll, we'll figure something out. Uh, is that, that Thursday deadline really doesn't work very well uh, for that week. We, we, we'll sort something out. Um, uh, announcements, project two, going to be released today in lab. It's gonna be the usual setting uh, of uh, the sequence of a project. There'll be a checkpoint in a week and then there'll be the rest. I wanna tell you something about the data. Um, you are going to look at murder rates and uh, look at, uh, compare murder rates in different states that have and don't have the death penalty. And uh, one of the things we're gonna look at, there's a period of history where there is an interesting comparison to make. Uh, in the early 1970s, there was you know, challenges against the death penalty about how it was being uh, uh, applied to people. And in the early 1970s, the Supreme Court suspended executions. So states that didn't have the death penalty, of course, didn't have executions, but states that did have the death penalty could not execute people. And so then, s several years after that, the suspension was lifted, so then executions began again. What you are going to do is you are going to study murder rates in states that did have the death penalty, that did not have the death penalty, while the uh, executions were suspended, and then when the executions were brought back. And you're gonna do some comparisons, and at the end, uh, there is something that I hope you will find interesting. Anyway, that's the, uh, that's the um, project, the data, and uh, the background is from a very serious paper in the Stanford Law Review. Um, and uh, I hope you'll have fun with it. Last time, students certainly enjoyed it. Um, so that's the main business, and so a as always, because there is a project, there won't be separate labs. Uh, you will be doing, working on the project in, la in lab. Every lab will have a period in the beginning where you will do a discussion worksheet. All those people who raise their hands and say, let's not do the discussion worksheet so that I can get credit on my lab, you're welcome to do that. But it's the discussion worksheets, those problems are gonna pop up on the final exam. So it's your choice. My suggestion is that you pay close attention to those discussion worksheets, if for no reason other than I pick the problems, right? And just as a practical matter, you should know the mind of the person who wields the power on the exam questions, right? Even if you are not interested in the concepts, you should know what goes on in my head. Uh, those problems are what goes on in my head. So please, please do not dismiss them. Do them, I've asked the GSIs not to, they, they, they talked about how much time it takes, so they're not gonna take the entire lab, they're gonna set themselves a certain amount of time, you're gonna do as much as you can in that time, and there may be a couple left over for you to talk about later. But don't not do any of them. Homework due as usual, courses to consider for the future, uh, again, I have no further info. Uh, next week, maybe, maybe. Um, okay. So, uh, any administrative questions? If not, we'll get on with looking at uh, shapes of distributions. Today's uh, lecture is about what is this bell-shaped curve, where does this pop up, and what has it got to do with anything that we've been studying thus far? Right, so rapid review. A standard deviation is a measure of spread that is trying to decide roughly how far off values are from the average. So you have a distribution, it has an average. Where in relation to the histogram does the average sit? In relation to the histogram, the average is the center of gravity, thank you. It's where the histogram balances. So then of course, not all the values are right at average, some are below, some are above. The SD gives a sense 
of how far off the values are from average, and that's a rough statement. It is made more formal by the statement that no matter what the distribution looks like, the bulk of the entries are in the range average plus or minus a few SDs. And we saw last time that a few is genuinely a few. Two, three, four, starting at five, you start getting a bit surprised. Six, seven, you're really surprised. And the uh, bounds, please, uh, these are bounds. So for any distribution whatsoever, if you look in the range average plus minus four SDs, and now I really want you to think of starting at the average as your origin and measuring distances in SDs. So if you start at the origin, walk one SD on either side, then another SD on either side, and you walk four SDs on either side, regardless of how ugly your histogram is, you will pick up at least 93.75% of the data. That is a very powerful result. Any result that applies to all distributions, no matter what, is very, very handy. Because if you know the average and the SD, you genuinely know uh, where the bulk of the histogram sits. Uh, a number of students asked me, what if I want to use the median as my measure of center, then what would I use as a measure of spread? You can't use the SD because it's defined relative to the average for, for very good reason. Uh, do you remember the midterm score summary that I sent out? Red was one of your Python notebooks. And I gave you the median, but I also gave you the 25th and 75th percentiles. You remember that? That is a standard way of uh, providing spread around a median. The 25th, 50th, and 75th percentiles are called the quartiles from quarter. First quarter, second quarter, third quarter. And the what percent are between the 25th and 75th percentiles? Between 25 and 75, what percent do you have? 50%. So if you know when you, uh, some of you did uh, college admissions when you went through the freshman admissions process, if you look at you know, roughly what range of SAT scores a school has, they give you the middle 50%. Yep, that's what they're giving you. They're giving you the 25th percentile, the 75th percentile, and somewhere in there is the 50th. And so that distance between the 25th and the 75th is uh, often used as a measure of spread. Doesn't have nearly as nice properties as the SD, as we will see in a minute. All right, so uh, this is true for all distributions. Now, for the average, uh, in relation to a histogram, you can kind of see yeah, it's roughly going to be here if you imagine yourself trying to balance the histogram on a pencil point. And you know exactly how good you are at that will depend on how good you are at hanging pictures on a nail. Eh, it's kind of this way, eh, it's kind of that way, now nah, it's kind of straight. Uh, but the SD is really hard to see. Physically, on a histogram, where is the SD? That is a difficult thing to see. Um, I'll skip uh, standard units uh, are a number of SDs above average. I just want to look at SD relative to the histogram. You can't usually see them except there is one distribution where the SD is clearly visible. And uh, I'd like to work with that distribution for a little while. So let me see. Uh, What I'm going to do is take a familiar data set. What I'm going to do is now look. We have looked at birth weights, gestational days, birth weights relative to gestational days. We've looked at age. We did a confidence interval for the mean. Um, we've looked at uh, what proportion are smokers and what proportions are not smokers. I want to look at a more boring variable. That's called the height, because there's one sense in which it is not boring. Um, so there you have 1,174 heights. The mean is 64, rounded to one decimal place. The SD is 2.5, rounded to one decimal place. And here is the histogram. Take a look at that. You see a shape? Yep, there's your bell shape. Uh, one thing I want you to take in, very few data histograms are bell-shaped. You have seen lots and lots of data histograms here. You've seen flight delays. You've seen uh, incomes, uh, total compensations. You've seen ages of pregnant women. Very few of them have been bell-shaped. Some distributions are. I'm going to use this one as an example of how to read the bell-shaped curve in relation to the average and the SD. 
the bell-shaped curve actually comes up in probability histograms, and that's what we're going to do next. All right, so let's just take a look at this. Uh, I chose this set of labels for a reason. The mean is 64, and the SD is 2.5. So, you know, I've been saying for a little bit that we're often going to start at the mean as the origin and walk in units of SDs on either side. So please look at the horizontal axis and convince yourself that it is mean plus minus one SD, plus minus two SDs, plus minus three SDs, and so on. So 64 plus or minus 2.5, plus or minus twice 2.5, plus or minus three times 2.5. Just convince yourself that that's what's happened there. Yeah, but I had to force that. That's not what, uh, um, what, um, Python does by default. So you can see what I'm, what I'm doing to force that. Uh, uh, ignore how I am placing them there. Just look at what I'm calling the positions. This is the array minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. You agree? Up to here? Yes? That many SDs above average. That's what's happened. Yep? So you remember standard units, the Z, is how many SDs above average. So these numbers, minus 3 to 3, are the Zs, and it's that many SDs above average. Now, this is an array, so every element gets multiplied by the SD. And then to that, to each element of that, you add the mean. And that's how you end up. Instead of minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, you end up with this sequence of numbers. Right? Yes. NP dot A range. No, it's just, so the question is, why is it to 3.1? It just won't go to the end, so it'll pick up three. That's all I want it to do. It doesn't have to be to four. It doesn't have to be an integer. Just as long as it skips past. I could have done 3.005. Right, I just want to capture the three. Okay? All right, so now what I'd like you to do is notice that the 64 is exactly where it ought to be. This is a bell-shaped histogram. The 64 is kind of the center. All fine? Very easy to spot the mean, SD. On a bell-shaped histogram, the SD has a clearly identifiable spot. Do you see that this bell starts like a cup that is upturned, sort of dropping water, and then turns into a cup that's right way up? Somewhere, there is where that changes. It goes like that to like this. Uh, anybody know formally what, that, what that's called? An inflection point. An inflection point. And if you, even if you don't know that, you know somewhere it's going from going down to going up. And on this picture, it kind of looks like about here. And you can't tell exactly, but it's kind of about there. There is a result uh, that says that for the bell-shaped distribution, the SD is the distance between the center and the point of inflection. And you should be able to see the point of inflection is, by I, not so far from 66.5, right? So the center is 64. First point of inflection is 66.5. The SD is the distance between those two. And what's the distance between those two? Two and a half. That's what we got by just using NP dot standard deviation. Symmetrically, on the other side, obviously, it should be also the distance between the, this should be the point of inflection on the other side. What's the distance between 61.5 and 64? Okay, I'm asking this for a reason. What is the distance between 61.5 and 64? 2.5, notice, you've dropped the sign. The word distance is how far regardless of sign. This is coming up. I'm seeing Piazza posts. What's wrong with my statistic? What's wrong with my statistic? What's wrong with my statistic? If you are saying distance, which is what you ought to be saying if you have a two-sided alternative, your statistic better have an absolute value in it. Difference is 61.5 minus 64. That's minus 2.5. That's a difference. But distances are positive. And so the SD on a bell-shaped curve is the distance between the center and the points of inflection on either side. And those two distances are equal. Okay? Now, why is that true? Some of you will be able to work that out in a moment. But for now, I just want you to look at this 
and check visually that you agree that it comes out correct, at least in this case. All right, so far that's where we are. So now, obviously there's this question of, well, exactly what is that curve? And what I would like you to do is to take a look at this and recognize that I put these numbers in inches here, but I could just as well have put minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, and three, and it would have been precisely the same curve, you agree? I could have measured in standard, standard units. In other words, there's just one curve the curve in standard units, and then you convert to inches or pounds or whatever it is that your data are in. And so what we're going to do is we are going to look at what is called the standard normal curve, uh, which has a very fancy equation. Don't write it down. I'm just showing it to you because it, is, uh, it contains every sexy number of mathematics. It has the square root of 2, it has pi, and it has e. Uh, it also happens to be an extraordinary formula that comes up in very many different places. It's a solution to the heat equation. It is an answer to this. It's an answer to that. It has very interesting uh, properties of you know, areas under the curve, but that's the curve. OK, so I want you to put a little bit of a math hat on. Notice that the curve goes stretches all the way on either side across the real line. Yes? All right, notice also that I'm calling my uh, given variable z. It's a function of z squared, all right? So if you look at z equals plus 2, you'll get some value. If you look at z equals minus 2, what value will you get? You'll get exactly the same. So it, symmetrically on either side of 0, you have the same value. This is a symmetric curve. Yes? All right. Now, as z gets larger, either positive or negative, as z gets away from 0, z squared gets away from 0. You agree? z squared gets huge. So minus z squared, which is kind of what's happening here, minus z squared is a large negative number as you move away from the center. e is a number that's between 2 and 3. If you take a number between 2 and 3 and you raise it to a large negative power, what are you doing? Well, first you're doing 1 over the number, so you're doing something like 1 over 2.78 something. Yes? That's a fraction, and you're raising it to a huge power. What are you going to get? A very small number. And so as z moves on either side, as it moves away, the curve comes down. So the peak is at 0, and then it drops off symmetrically on either side. And you can see that by just a rough examination of the formula. Uh, let me show you what it looks like. Uh, ignore the plotting commands. Uh, we're not going to ask you to use those. We have to actually fix those so that they're a little bit uh, easier to use. So there, there's your curve. You can see that it's centered at zero. Um, and then it drops off on either side. You should look at the horizontal axis. Those are standard units. Center 0, plus minus 1, where's the point of inflection? Plus minus 1. Yes? Um, and we noticed last time that if a variable is measured in standard units, then the average is 0 and the SD is 1. Right? So this is where uh, you're seeing that plus minus 1. Those of you who have some calculus chops can actually do the second derivative and check that plus minus 1 are the two points of inflection. All right. Um, what I would like you to do is look at the horizontal axis. You see standard units there? 0, plus, minus 1, et cetera. Now, the curve, in theory, goes out to minus infinity and plus infinity. But in practice, where, are the, where is the area? Plus, minus 4, basically. Yes? Really, plus, minus 3. This is consistent with what Chebyshev is telling us, the bounds. It's actually even stronger. It's very tight. If you have a bell-shaped distribution, pretty much all the data are within 3 SDs of the mean. 
Um, it's a fact about this data set, and this is something that we are not going to prove in this class, though you might see it in a class where they do polar coordinates, that the total area under this curve is one. Therefore, you should think of it as a histogram that has been drawn to the density scale. You remember all the fuss we went through when we did histograms. The total area has to be one, and the heights are densities. They're not actually proportions. The areas are proportions. It is so that we could put these kinds of curves, continuous curves, over your histograms where areas are proportions. Okay, so I'm gonna do a little bit, I'm gonna actually stop and take questions on anything that I've said thus far. Um, and then we'll do a little bit of work with uh, finding areas and then see where they come up. Looks like so far so good, okay. Um, so uh, we are gonna to want to find areas under the normal curve because our distributions, it, uh, by the way, the curve is called the normal curve because under certain circumstances, which we will meet in a few minutes, uh, it, the curve is the norm. However, as you know very well, it is not the norm for data. Data have bizarre shaped distributions usually. This one that I've drawn with the standard unit scale on the horizontal axis is called the standard normal curve for, because it's in standard units. Okay, now we're gonna to wanna to find areas under this curve because some histograms are going to come out to be uh, normally distributed and you wanna have some sense uh, of how this, if you have a distribution that has this shape, then you know how much do you capture within a few SDs. Uh, and uh, so we wanna find areas under a curve. Calculus people, how do you find areas under a curve? You integrate, right? Okay, so this curve has a finite integral. The uh, integral uh, total in area is equal to one. So you ought to be able to, if I want the area under this curve between minus two and plus one, you ought to be able to take that function and write the integral sign minus two to plus one dz, agreed? If you don't know what I'm talking about, it doesn't matter because we're not gonna do that anyway. Okay, there is a remarkable property of this curve which is that even though we know that answer has to be finite, it is a theorem that you cannot get that answer exactly using any of the known functions. That's a remarkable theorem. It's not that I can't get the answer or you can't get the answer or this math department can't get the answer. It's nobody can get the answer. Think of what it takes. This is a deeply philosophical uh, argument that is needed to prove such a fact. So that integral, actually, it's not that it's difficult to do, it can't be done with the functions that we have at our disposal, and that is why every statistics textbook has at the back of it a table of areas, because there isn't a formula. And every statistical system, Python included, has a function that gives you those areas. How? By approximating this smooth curve by tiny little matchsticks. Right, so you just make it, you know, just take very narrow intervals and go jag make a little jagged figure, then each little bit is a math stick which looks like a trapezoid, and you can find the area of that, and then you make the math sticks as fine as you want. And there are better methods than that of approximating areas. But A, you need the area on the under the curve. B, there's no formula for it. So C, you need either a function in Python or you need a table at the back of a stats book. And that's just something that you're gonna to have to accept from me. I don't know where in the math classes or in the probability classes this is actually proved, but it's true. Okay, so therefore, scipy, scientific Python. From scipy import stats, that gives you a huge bunch of formulas, uh, that, uh, methods that you can use to calculate probabilities and find areas and so on. All those of you who are doing STAT88, import that thing and look at binome, you're doing binomials and so on, you can pop out numbers rather easily. So I'm gonna import that thing. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and find areas under this curve. And the first area that we're gonna find is the area under the curve to the left of one. In general, we're gonna find areas that start out here at minus infinity and then stop somewhere. Now, uh, in probability theory, those areas have uh, a uh, jaw-breaking name. They are called the cumulative distribution function, and therefore the method is called CDF. And you are going to use stats.norm.cdf. That's all you need to know is that that stands for cumulative distribution function, 
And if you want to know more, I am teaching both STAT 134 and STAT 140 next term. You're welcome. Um, okay, so we're going to find this shaded area to the left of one. And if you want to know why, you'll see in just a moment. Okay. So this, in terms of data, this is the proportion that are 1 SD above average or less. Yeah? Okay, so that's the shaded area, and the function stats.norm.cdf at 1 gives you back exactly this area. 84%. Fine. So what? So what's the unshaded area? 16%. The total area is 1. The area to the left is 84, so the area to the right has to be 16, yes? So once you have all these areas to the left, you can use the symmetry of the curve to find any other area you want. So, for example, uh, what we just did was, again, it, please ignore the plotting commands. We want to find this, then we're going to do 1 minus, so the 1 is the total, we're going to do 1 minus all of this area, and we better end up with 16%. That's about 16%. Okay, so you know that. Well, then, what I'm going to look is, uh, what, what I'm going to try and find is what's the gold area there. And in terms of data, what is that? It is the proportion of data values that are within one SD of average. In the range, average plus or minus one SD. You agree? Regardless of your data, as long as the data are roughly bell-shaped. Okay, so how do I find that? I've got lots of ways. I know this, right? What's that? 16. What's the blue part? Also 16 by symmetry. So that's 32 on the outside. What's inside? 68. Yep, so 68% are in the range uh, average plus or minus 1 SD if the distribution is normal. Uh, the reason we have shaded it in this way is if you want to use stats.norm.cdf directly, you can see that it's all the area to the left of 1 minus all the area to the left of minus 1. You agree? So it's the CDF at 1 minus the CDF at minus 1. It's from here down to here minus from minus 1 down to here. And we better get 68%, and we do. So if you want to find the area between uh, point A and point B on the normal curve, just subtract CDFs. All right, uh, and so if we want to do the area between minus 2 and plus 2, then we will do CDF at plus 2 minus the CDF at minus 2, and we will get 95%. Okay, what does Chebyshev tell us? What proportion are in the range average plus or minus 2 SDs? Anybody remember? At least 75%. So Chebyshev says, no matter how awful the shape of the distribution, the proportion in the range, average plus minus 2 SDs, is at least 75%. What we've learned now is that if you happen to know a whole lot more about the distribution, in particular if you happen to know that it is bell-shaped, then that at least 75%, you can do much better and say it's approximately 95%. And you can play this game with other uh, values as well. And so we've already seen uh, the bulk of the data are within average plus minus a few SDs. If the histogram is bell-shaped, then e almost everything is in the range average plus minus three SDs. And here's your table. Uh, the point here is that if you look here, what you've got for all distributions is a bound that at least matters. Yes? So this much or more is what is being said. Here, this is an approximation. When should you use the approximation? When you're pretty darn sure that your data resemble the normal curve, the histogram resembles the normal curve. If you use that approximation for incomes, you are out to lunch. Incomes are skewed usually on one side. So before you start throwing around those approximation numbers, draw your histogram and just, you know, honest to goodness, say to yourself, okay, you know what, I think this is bell-shaped. Um, so... 
So for example, if you read a statement now in a textbook that says, the heights of men in the United States uh, are roughly normally distributed, true statement, with an average of 69 inches, close to true, and an SD of about three inches, and it's slightly, slightly under. Roughly normal, average 69, SD three. Roughly normal, in theory, means there could be somebody with a height of minus 75 kilometers. Yes? However, this observation says that the bulk, that almost everybody, is going to be in the range 69 plus or minus three times three. Yes? So it's not silly to say that a positive distribution is roughly normal. It's because almost everybody, if your distribution is normal, is in the range plus or minus, uh, average plus or minus three. Uh, so I hear from students, it's a 68, 95, 99 rule. Please correct that. It's a 68, 95, 99.73 rule. 99.73 is a lot closer to 100% than 99. All right. All okay? This is just mechanics of normal curve. All right, so now what I want to do is to examine where exactly does this crop up when we are doing data science? Uh, because we have noticed that it doesn't often crop up with data, even though you're told that story in statistics classes. Um, and so what I would like you to do is to go back and remember one of the places where this cropped up. We had the roulette wheel. And you remember we did some bets on roulette? And we more or less found out that if you bet lots of times uh, on any particular bet, and which is what is happening when thousands of people are going in and betting, then you're going to lose money. In other words, the casino is fairly certain that it's going to make money. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to reprise that and spot where the normal curve comes up and then look at some uh, examples that look quite different but also come out normal and then make a one collective uh, statement about that. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to bet on red. And the bet on red uh, pays even money. Somebody remind me what that means. So you bet on red. Uh, there are 38 pockets. Which pockets win for you? The red pockets, right? And I'll just remind you, out of the 38, 18 of the pockets are red. All right, so the bet pays even money. It pays one to one. Means what? If you bet a dollar, I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, so if you bet $1, then your net winnings, if you win, is $1. And if you lose, you lose your dollar. Yep, you remember this. Okay, so I'm going to recall a function that we defined. So for each of these colors, there's either a plus one or a minus one, and we defined a function that produced that answer. So, and the reason I'm taking you through it again is to remind you about defining functions, def, statement, def statement accompanied by return statements, right? The function returns something. Please know that this is its own little world. The label, the, this name color here is known only to this little world, right? Elsewhere, it has no meaning unless you define it to be something. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, it's uh, if uh, it's red, return one, and so on. Okay, so that's our function. What I'd like to do is I would like to replace these colors by their plus ones and minus ones, and so we are going to apply this function to this column, um, and that's what we do here. So table.apply function to column, that's this one. Uh, we've done this before, but this is just a little reminder. And so now what is this? Nothing random has happened yet. All we've done is we have created a column that says how much you will win if you, uh, uh, the winning pocket is a particular one. That's all we've done. And so, if I just play once, then here is the histogram of my net gain. If I just play once, I will either, my net gain will either be minus one dollar or plus one dollar. Yes? The proportion over minus one dollar is 20 over 38. The proportion over plus one dollar is 18 over 38. Notice that it's not exactly even. The probabilities aren't even, the payoff odds are, and that's why you make money, right? Okay, so one bet isn't really interesting other than if you make two, three hundred bets, you are drawing 
at random with replacement from this distribution. This distribution is not bell-shaped at all. It is some bizarre shaped distribution. It's got two bars. If you bet over and over again, you are drawing at random with replacement from this distribution, and at the end, the total amount of money that you make is gotten by adding up all your draws. You agree? You're going to get a string of plus ones and minus ones. You're going to add them up, and that's going to be your net winnings. OK, we've done that before. We're going to do it again, same function as we did last time. And not a function, actually. We're just going to run it. So I'm going to do 400 bets. I'm just going to call that number of bets. I'm going to do 10,000 repetitions. OK, so we're going to get our net gain on red in 400 $1 bets on red. Collect your data in an empty array. For each repetition, spin the wheel. So what is red? Red is this table right here. Dot sample 400 times. There's, uh, by default, it's with replacement. That is exactly what you want. At the end of this, you get something called spins. What is spins? It is a table. OK, so from that spins, so it's a spin, it's a table that is rows of this. So it has three columns. And it's the last column that's of interest to us. And it has how many rows? This table spins. Has three columns. How many rows? 400, one for every spin. And the third column is a string of plus ones and minus ones. That's the amount you win or lose on every bet. And so what we're interested in is the sum of those things. And hence, finally, this is the statistic that we calculate. Spins dot column, that last one, that is now an array. You add that up, and that's a number. And you call that new net gain on red. And then you append that to the uh, empty array that you've already got. I'm going through it, this in detail. Subsequently, we'll have 10 more like this, and I, we won't go through those at all, right? Because they're exactly the same. You just change what you are uh, calculating there. OK, so at this point, uh, you are done. At this point, net gain on red has 10,000 elements, each of which is a net gain. I'm just collecting that on a table here. OK, I'm going to run this thing. And while it's running, you can. Uh, Ask me any questions that you have. If it seems we've done this before, that's exactly how it's supposed to seem. OK, we're done. And this is what the distribution looks like. You see a familiar curve? OK, so I will run it again. And again, this one's even prettier, right? You just keep doing that. You see the normal curve popping up. Note, you are sampling at random with replacement from this distribution. That's a weird distribution. You're sampling from that, and then you're adding up 400 results. Yes? And you're just doing that 10,000 times. So you get 10,000 numbers like that. The distribution of those sums is roughly normal. That's what you're saying. All OK? All right. I would like to look at the mean and the SD. You agree the mean is somewhere near minus 20, maybe a little bit to the left? Yes? Where's the SD? What's the SD? Take a look. Talk to your neighbor. OK, bell-shaped curve, yes? How do you spot the SD on a bell-shaped curve? Inflection point, you start at the top, and you go and see, oop, where does it change? Should we do that? You're going to tell me where to stop? 
All right. So here I am. You tell me when to stop. Right there? OK. So I mean, you're not going to get it exactly right. Yeah? But so I come down here, 0. You're telling me 0 is the point of inflection. You agree? So the mean is minus 20. 0 looks like a point of inflection. So what's the SD? 20. It's the distance between minus 20 and 0. 20 is the SD. That's what you're saying by i. Shall we check it out? Let's check it out. Um, so um, uh, how about we do, what was my thing called? Net gain red. OK, how about we do NP dot mean net gain red. OK, we got minus 21. OK, we said it was minus 20 a little bit below. Not bad, by eye. Yep? OK. Um, standard deviation. OK, this is the moment of truth. How much did you tell me it was? 20, roughly. Not bad. Yes? So now when you see a normal curve, you can spot the mean and the SD. Um, when we come back um, on uh, Friday, we will talk about why minus 21 exactly and why 20. But for now, just note that it's normal and you can pick off by I the mean and the SD. Okay. So here is something that came out normal. It is what? It is the empirical distribution of 10,000 repetitions of an experiment. Right? So that's like the probability distribution of the random quantity. What's the random quantity? The random quantity is your net gain in 400 bets on red. That has certain values, and those values are along here, and the proportions are represented by areas under this curve. So probability is for the sum of 400 draws, roughly normal. Uh, let's play the game again. How about with something that looks quite different? Our flight delays, 13,825 of them, right? Nasty, nasty population. What we're going to do is we're going to randomly sample from this population and take the mean. We've done that before. I just want to do it again. Um, but before we do that, let's take a look at the mean and SD of this distribution itself. The mean's about 17. Look at the SD. Almost 40. An average of 16 to 17 with an SD of about 40. Look how large the SD is relative to the average. Where is that large SD coming from? Uh, 16, 17 is somewhere here. You're suddenly not getting 40 over on this side. What you have is a very small number of values that are out here, and therefore you have a very small number of very large deviations. And do you remember the deviations get squared in the calculation of the SD? So even a very small number of very large deviations can have a noticeable effect on the SD. So that large SD is coming from that long, thin tail on the right-hand side. That's just an observation we're going to make. Anyway, what you're noticing is that this distribution ain't normal, nothing like normal. So now what we're going to do is we're going to sample from this. And because I don't want to carry around everything in the uh, table, I'm just going to look at, uh, I've just uh, reduced the table to one column. So 13,825 13, flights, from which we are going to sample 400 and take the sample mean. So I want you to be really clear what we're doing here. We have a population of approximately 14,000. We are going to sample 400 times at random with replacement. Do you want to sample without replacement? A lot of people would be happier sampling without replacement if you're throwing your hand in and taking stuff out. Please note that when you have 400 taken out of about 14,000, whether you sample with replacement or without replacement isn't going to make that much difference. Right? Why are those two ways different? It is because when without replacement sampling, every time you take something out, you're kind of changing the proportions inside. But if you only take about a few hundred out of 14,000, you don't change proportions very much at all. So you might as well be sampling with replacement. And this is typically the situation in data science. You've got a massive great population. And you can only afford to sample a relatively small number. 
That is why results for width replacement sampling are just good enough. So we are going to sample 400 times width replacement and calculate the mean of the sample, and then we're going to do that 10,000 times. All with me? Okay. So we run this thing. You can go and read the code. It is exactly the same as before. We've just got a mean instead of a sum here. Chug, chug, chug. We're done. That was fast. A familiar shape. So what is that? That is approximately the probability histogram of the sample mean. On the horizontal axis, you get what the sample mean could possibly be. Would you expect the sample mean to be? Let me give you the numbers back. This was the population mean. Would you expect the sample mean to be? Somewhere around there, right? So that's about 16.7, somewhere in the 16, 17 range, that's where you expect the sample mean to be? So you expect the bulk of the sample means that you generate to be somewhere around the 16, 17 range, and that's what you're saying. Yep. And now you're going to be off by a certain amount, and that's the business of next time, but you notice that you're off symmetrically on either side and falling down in that bell. Um, so what we have is we have now a large random sample, and we have the probabilities for the sample mean. Those are also roughly normal. Um, how about proportions? Here's Mendel's model, uh, purple, purple, and white flowers. Uh, we are going to grow 200 of these plants and uh, look at the proportion that are purple. Mendel's model is good. We've seen that. What proportion purple do you expect? About 75%. That's what you expect. Yes? Uh, and then, of course, not exactly 75%, a bit this way or that. So let's run. Notice that we are doing uh, in our sample how many are purple and then dividing by the total number of plants. That's the proportion. And so we've done that. And lo and behold, proportion. Also normal, um, centered around 0.75, which was your prediction. And there's a little bit of a plus or minus. So far, so good? All right. So what have we noticed? The sample sum, the random sample sum, has a roughly normal probability distribution. The random sample mean has a roughly normal probability distribution. These are all large samples, by the way. Yes? The proportion is a mean. It's a mean of zeros and ones. Therefore, the proportion also, uh, the sample proportion has a roughly normal distribution. And if I run this one more time with a larger sample, so I'm now running it with a sample of size 1,000 instead of 400. Both are normal. The one with the larger sample is narrower. Large samples are more accurate, right? OK, so the big theorem of the day, the central limit theorem, it's at the heart of the subject. It says, if the sample is A large, B random of a particular kind, random sample with replacement, then no matter what you are drawing from, no matter how ugly the thing you are drawing from, the probability distribution of the sample sum or the average, the average is just the sum times a constant, yes? The average includes the proportion. That is roughly bell-shaped. Note again that this is a result that is true regardless of the population, provided you have a large sample. That is why it is powerful, because you often don't know what the sample looks like, but you still know what sample averages and sample proportions look like. And that is where you have some power in inference. And so we're going to explore more on Friday. <laughs>